So one name that keeps coming up through our 9-11 investigations is Larry Silverstein and Silverstein Properties. And why that's interesting is in uh, April of 2001, Silverstein Properties took out a lease, a 99-year lease for $3.2 billion on the Twin Towers. Now, there was a few other smaller buildings in that lease, but the, the major part was the Twin Towers, 210-story building. There was like building four and five or something. In spring of 2000, so about a year before he signed this deal, the Twin Towers were valued at $1.2 billion. So you go, 99-year lease, $3.2 billion. Yeah, there's a couple other small things, but it's the Twin Towers. Now, the Twin Towers a year earlier were valued at $1.2 billion. So, I don't know, something strange there. So Silverstein Properties and Larry Silverstein already owned somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 million square feet of real estate in the New York City area. That included Building 7. Now, Building 7 really keeps coming up as something strange throughout this investigation because Building 7 went down in a free fall. Why did Building 7 go down in a free fall? It was reported that the fires in Building 7 caused it to collapse. The fires in Building 7 caused Building 7 to go into a free fall. That's got to be scary. It's got to be scary for people working or living in high-rise buildings that if there ever was a fire, that building would come down free fall. Has that ever happened anywhere before in the world? There's been fires None of them have ever come down free fall or tumbled or the top half tilted over. None of them. Yet on this day, three buildings for sure come down in free fall. We've seen it with our own eyes. It's, it was on television. It's not somebody's opinion. It's not a calculated number. We've seen it live. Building 7 housed the SEC, which is the Securities Exchange Commission. Among things, they investigate wrongdoing in the financial district. At this time, there was somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 4,000 cases being investigated. In those cases, two of the major companies being investigated were Enron and Global Crossings. All these investigations going on. Building 7 comes down and lo and behold, all that investigative material, all those documents, all the information, all gone. And then shortly after, maybe within a year or so, you have all these companies filing for bankruptcy. Well, that's interesting because probably most of the information that could be of conflict is now gone. Now we need to look into what were these buildings insured for? How much were they insured for? And what did he collect? And it goes deeper because every time I start looking into it, then I find out it wasn't his money that he put in to lease the buildings. He borrowed that money from GMAC. Everybody knows GMAC. You buy a Chevrolet or something, it's financed by GMAC. So they lent him the downstroke for the lease, which was four or 500 million, somewhere in that area. You had to put a downstroke for the lease. So not even his money, borrowed it from GMAC took out insurance on the buildings, insured the Twin Towers for $3.5 billion. So one of the insurers, industrial risk insurers, they agreed in May of 2002 to pay Silverstein $861 million for his policy covering Building 7. Now, there's talk about how much he had invested in the building. It was, it was nowhere near that. He, it, it was, in the end, when you, you do the math, you made out like 500 million. Now, at the time, the U.S. was either close to recession, the, the market was going nowhere, and it was just about time to say the R word, but they weren't that. So uh, why would a developer in a recession or close to it, where usually the financial, which those buildings were full of financial insurance people in a recession, you're the first to go, so office space for rent, so you're gonna pay three. Now there's some beautiful facts. He's battling 22 insurance companies over the payment. He wants 3.5 billion per building, so that's 7 billion. The insurance is only willing to give him 3.5 billion, which is still 0.3 billion over what he leased it for. 
That's not enough, so, and he's confident the courts will settle with him. Find out for yourselves. I don't know, what did he get? I bet you he got more than 3.5, because that's what they offered him. So Larry made out pretty well. Silverstein Properties turned their $14 million investment into $5 billion in only 49 days. But apparently that wasn't enough for Silverstein, because years later he battled the airline companies for an extra $12.3 billion. Law school paid off for this guy. He's learned, like he said, the lawyers control what's in the contract. That's why he wanted to be a lawyer. While you were at NYU, you were working part-time with your dad. That is correct. And in, in, in leasing of these That's small right. spaces right. and, and everything. And then you decide that you want to go to law school. Why That's do you right. want to go to law school? Well, because in observing the transactions which my father was involved in leasing these spaces, it was the lawyers who made the decisions. Uh, that affected whether or not a deal was going to get done. And so my thought was become uh, knowledgeable with respect to issues that, that lawyers deal with and as a result be a better, more proficient, more able real estate broker. So every morning Larry would have breakfast in Windows on the World with his tenants to discuss their leases and uh, just so happened to be at a dermatologist appointment the morning of September 11th. How convenient. His two children also happened to be running late that day. Hmm, interesting. Now I have to mention there's this popular clip of Silverstein talking about Building 7, saying, you know, there was a tremendous loss of life that day. The firefighters didn't think they could put out the fire, so we just decided to pull it. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. So this is interesting because there's been some debate about whether or not he meant pull the firefighters from the area and then just watch it burn. But if you rewatch the clip, he's clearly talking about the demolition term, pull it. Um, you can call your local demolition company if you want, but they'll tell you that the term pull it means to physically pull the building down in the direction you want it to fall, so it's not gonna fall on a building you don't want it to or whatever. But that's not something you can easily do with a 47-story building, and that's not what we see in the videos, so the official story is bogus, and so is Silverstein's. But the interesting part to me is when he talks about the old Twin Towers, and basically says their design quality was so poor, that's why they collapsed the way that they did. But we know this is a lie because they were built to withstand multiple impacts from jet airliners, and it wasn't the jet fuel that turned 98% of the building into dust. You can watch our documentary to learn more about that. But yeah, there's something up here, all things considered. Six weeks and you make $5 billion. You just happen to be at the doctor's that day, and your kids just happen to be late for their meetings, and uh, you believe that jet fuel can turn 210-story buildings pretty much into dust? Okay. It's important to realize that the towers were designed for airliner impacts. John Skilling, the structural engineer in charge, said that in the event of an airliner impact, quote, the building structure would still be there. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door, this intense grid, and the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. It really does nothing to the screen netting. The experience that we had on 9-11 changed us totally and the, changed our way of thinking and gave us a realization of how not to build high-rise office buildings. Twin Towers were built in a different, at a different time, in a different era, uh, different materials, different concepts, different attitudes, right? Post 9-11 changed all of that. So when we decided to put back seven, seven World Trades, yeah. last building to come down on 9-11, first building to go back up after that, we decided, I said to myself, we're going to occupy space in this building 
It's a family company. I'm going to have family. I'm going to be surrounded by family. I'm going to be surrounded by extended family, the other people who work for us. I want this to be the safest building that's ever been built in America, ever. Right? So what we did was to do extremely extensive research on what caused 9-11, what caused sequential collapse of the Twin Towers to begin with. So if you haven't seen our 9-11 documentary, Where Did the Towers Go? The second edition is up now, and it proves that this NIST report that Silverstein was a part of is totally fraudulent, and Dr. Judy Wood has already filed a key TAM case for science fraud against all these companies. So now, remember, people, this happened coming up 20 years ago. A lot of these characters involved, getting pretty old, won't be around to you know, pay the price for what they did if they did do something. I'm not saying anybody did anything. I'm just saying, why do so many coincidences happen on one terrible, terrible, terrible day? It would almost make you think that someone had pre-knowledge of something happening and benefited from it. That is the worst kind of insider trading you're ever going to find is where it includes massive loss of life all for a dollar, for a price.